So those gift cards um, that are in your thank you notes are a reminder that uh, how many times have you ever gotten a, or received a gift, you've accepted it, and uh, you put it away, you carried it to your room, or you put it in the car if you were at a party, and you forget it. I mean, you kind of lose it. Like you get a new pair of pants, you put them on a hanger, and you hang them in the closet, and one day later when you're much heavier, you can't wear them, and they were new a year ago. Or maybe you tucked it underneath the, the bed, and you thought, okay, I'll get to that, and you're trying to straighten your room. You've done that, huh, right? I mean, you've been there. And that's really frustrating. Um, and I think in so many ways, uh, well, sometimes you regift it, right? You, don't, you know when you got that gift, I'm never going to use that. It's a potato peeler, and I don't peel potatoes, you know? And I'm never going to use it. So you put it away, and you think, I'll regift that to somebody else. But um, for many Christians, the Holy Spirit is somewhat like that forgotten gift, that you put it away, uh, it gets tucked underneath the couch or underneath the bed or put in the closet, and the Holy Spirit becomes overlooked, forgotten, and an unused gift that God has bestowed upon each one of us who would believe in His Son, Jesus. Last week, I meant to share this illustration because I thought, well, one, I like J.D. Greer, and he's a great communicator, but he said that the Holy Spirit is like the pituitary gland. Most people know they got it, and they don't want to be without it, but they don't want to talk much about it because they don't know anything about it, and, you know, it's just kind of, it's there. And reading that and not having, I just read it as a quote on the internet, and I thought, well, Cliff, do you know what the pituitary gland does? Yeah, sure. No, let me see what Google says it means. It is a gland in the base of your brain that is one of the smallest ones that provides oversight and harmony to all the other glands in the body. Think about that. J.D. was on to something because the Holy Spirit is that, which brings unity, which brings harmony to the body of Christ. So today we pick back up at John 14 with the um, probably the least known disciple of the 12. This is Judas, the other Judas, mentioned in uh, Luke 6 as Judas, I think, son of James. But it's not Judas Iscariot, the one who would betray Jesus, asking Jesus a question. And Jesus then, he really doesn't answer it directly, but he expands upon it and he explains to us that through his love and our love of him and our obedience to him and the gift of the Holy Spirit, we can receive peace. And basically, we receive part three, if you will, because I've been doing this for three Sundays in a row, the cure for a troubled heart. So if you have your Bibles, John 14, we'll look at verses um, 22 through 27 today. Those of you who are with us for the very first time, We've been working on the Gospel of John for a year and a half. Here we are. Then Judas, not Judas Iscariot, said, But Lord, why do you intend to show yourself to us and not to the world? Some commentators say that goes back to the earlier verses when Jesus is talking about, although the world does not see him, you see me, and it's that type of thought. There's also a second coming thought in this. There's also the fact that he, they're still afraid that Jesus is going to be taken from them, even though he's told them that's going to happen, and they're confused. So Judas is asking this question, and Jesus replies in verse 23, If anyone loves me, he will obey my teaching. My Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. He who does not love me will not obey my teaching. These words you hear are not my own. They belong to the Father who sent me. All this I have spoken while still with you. But the Counselor, that's that word paraclete, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. And like the bookend from John 14 verse 1, let not your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. He says, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. Let's pray. 
Father, as we have uh, looked once again at these words that are to bring us comfort, to bring a healing for our troubled hearts, we pray that the gift that you have extended to us would not become that forgotten gift. Whether it be the Holy Spirit we're talking of or the very peace that only you can provide, let us use that gift. Let us show that gift to one another. And Father, help us to not be afraid. For with you, we can overcome the world. Speak to us in this hour, for we pray it in Christ's name. Amen. So knowing it's a longer service today, it's a one-point sermon, as opposed to the pointless sermons I normally preach. <laughs> One point. Accept his peace. Accept his peace. What a priceless gift. I should stop right there. You know, those of you who have been in the military, I used the word priceless one time in an OPR. That's an officer's performance report. And the general sent it back to me and said, Chaplain, you, you used the word priceless. To me, that means nothing. So think about that. If it's priceless, it can mean zero. But I mean it in the most highest way. Jesus has given us the most extravagant gift he can. God has given us the most extravagant gift he can in the form of his son. And the son has promised to the Holy Spirit through the Father. And it makes me think of all the gifts that I had to give in the military. How many of you, whether you're military or civilian, you have Hey, we're, you know, so-and-so's going away. Give some money to the going away gift. Have you ever had to do that? Shake your heads. No, you've never done that. Okay, well, bear with me. Um, my first assignment here at Lackland, 37 chaplains came and left while I was there in four years. Those of you who are military, you know, a lot of places have what they call a landing fee. You get there, you give them $100, and that covers your going away gift. I mean, it really does. I mean, you never have to pay again because it's a pool, and when you leave, there's a $100 gift that you get. Uh, Lackland did not have that when I was there. So after giving for 37 different guys leaving, guys and gals leaving, I was like, come on, this is, there's got to be a stop to this. And the more I learned about giving within the Department of Defense, there are ceilings, there are caps. You can't give a gift to a commander or a general or whatever it might be that is over a certain amount. Then, of course, there's always that mischievous follower, well, we could do it this way, you know, and try to get him an even better gift or her a better gift. And those gifts were always given, usually at the farewell. And if it's at the farewell, more than likely, that man or woman's household goods have already been packed. They've already been shipped. So now you've given them this, I don't know, whether it be a shadow box or Set of golf clubs, I don't, I don't think they ever gave a set of golf clubs, but it's something that now they have the burden of having to ship on themselves or carry with them as they move to the next place. Jesus is not giving us such a gift. He is giving us something that can be with you at all times. In fact, he wants to come and abide in you. Jesus tells Judas and the others, if you love me and obey me, the theme this week, twist. The twist is that God will come to you. I had to read that again. Look at this again with me. I'll read it again. That's about the second verse. Whoever has my commands and obeys them, he is the one who loves me. He who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I too will love him and show him himself to me. And then he comes down to where I'm talking about in verse 23. If anyone loves me, he will obey my teaching. And there's a, there's a period there. It doesn't say, and then my father will love him. It says, my father will love him and will come to him. I think that is mind-blowing, that the God of the universe wants to be in you, wants to be in residence. That's the same word that he uses, you know, I'm going to build a mansion for you, a room for you, a place for you. God wants to take up a dwelling in your life if you will only love his son. We read in scriptures that before we ever knew him, Christ died for us. But you must receive the Son for the Father to come into you. Hmm. God coming to me. Sometimes we won't obey. And if you don't obey, Jesus basically is telling us that troubled days are ahead for you in your heart if you don't love me and obey my commandments. Then in verse 25, 
we get the second of five times in this upper room discourse the conversation of the Holy Spirit. He reminds us of this promise that he's told us in the verses from last week. And once again, we see the function. Last week, I talked about all the different ways you can define or explain the Holy Spirit, whether it's an encourager, an enabler, uh, one who would rebuke. I mean, it has parental roles. I even thought of, I don't think I shared this last week, maybe I did, with these, you've done children's plays, right? And often, the, the director is on the side encouraging, giving the words, or pulling them back when they're in the wrong place. That, too, is a way to look at what the Holy Spirit does for us. But he gives us this thing that he will remind you of all that I have taught you. Well, let him teach you and remind you right now. Look at verse 27. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you, I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled, and do not let it be afraid. The word peace in the original language here, and I could always remember it easily, it's my mother-in-law's uh, first name, Irene. Irene is the Greek word for peace. In Hebrew, it's shalom. And most of you know that that is a greeting, both a hello and a goodbye. You could say Irene. In fact, Paul writes most of his letters, grace and peace to you. He's constantly telling us to remember the grace and the peace that comes through Jesus. And today we must receive that peace of God. But so often I tend to do that which I don't want to do. I mean, I speak to myself when I preach to you. Hopefully, we have some of the same tendencies. I think if you're human, you would. Paul writes, I think, in Romans 7, that the very thing I want to do, I don't do, and the thing I shouldn't do, I do. How many of you get anxious these days? You get anxious for your health. You get anxious for your children, your grandchildren. You get anxious at your jobs. Jesus says, do not fear. I am with you. He says, my peace I give not like the world gives, you still will have the bees that come up and sting your little VBS students and get like five of them stung. That will still happen, but he's still in charge. And thank God no one was allergic to no one, you know, revolted and no one brought the police out because the bees were here. But that idea of receiving and accepting his peace is something that our church needs to practice, and I think it will help us as we combat the anxieties of life. You know, peace is to be that which calms. It becomes that, that fortress by knowing Jesus, by receiving him and, and letting his Holy Spirit live in us. It, it allows that fortress of peace to combat that which would come at us. And in many churches... Many denominations that are, have a little more um, regimented liturgy, passing of the peace is a part of the service. In fact, after the pastor or priest or whomever it is that's been leading the service has had a prayer of confession, sometimes even using kneelers, and I know Baptist churches don't usually have kneelers, and I'm not asking you to kneel because half of you couldn't get back up. <laughs> Most of you get back up faster than I would. But in just a moment, I'm going to ask you to pass the peace to one another. And in that traditional background, the first person would say, anybody, first let me say, anybody grow up in a tradition that you did passing of the peace? Oh, wow. One, two, three, four, okay, five. Some of you have done that before. Six, seven, all right. You would say, peace of Christ to you, and then what did you say back to me? Peace to you, yeah, unto you, or back to you. Back at you, buddy. <laughs> it's the idea that you have now proclaimed to everyone, I have the peace of Christ in my life. And I want to share it with you. And you say, I've got it too, and I want to give it back to you, brother. And what a transition that can be for our minds, and what a strengthening it is for the congregation. And that's why it's typically done before communion. So today we are going to share communion, and I'm going to ask Steve and the crew to come up here. They're going to share with you a new song, which is really a communion song. But before Dan comes to lead us in communion, I'm going to ask you to stand 
and share it with one another, not just the person beside you. And this is different than the gripping and grinding that we do often when we welcome one another. Truly share the peace of Christ to the person beside you, and then in turn, you offer that peace back to them. So let's do that now.